Mr. Johnson. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear. I can hear you. How are you? Good. Looks like you got a haircut. Yes, I did. I did. I finally did. After six months, I went on and uh, did it. Let me change my background. Good evening, everyone. Hey, Wilma, how you doing? I am doing well. I hope everyone else is. Good. Doing pretty good. Well. Good. Good evening, everyone. Oh, hello. Miss Conyers, I believe I owe you some minutes. I think you started needing to get a, an approved minutes. I think I sent you uh, July, but I didn't send you August, I don't believe. I believe I have August. Um, you do have, oh, okay, okay. Something was labeled August and um, okay. I, read okay. them, I read them and uh, it was August business, so. Okay, you're, so the approved ones for posting. Okay, all right, you're good, okay. So are you referring to the July approved? No, I um, I thought I, I knew I had sent July. I thought, I thought it was August that I had not sent. Well, you sent that out with the agenda. This is September. Uh, that's right, never mind. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. So after tonight, I need to make if there's any any changes that I need to get those right. to you. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is September. Okay. So our chairman um, is going to be late, and I believe he was expecting our vice chair to, to call the meeting to order. And I believe Brian is with us. Yes, yeah, sorry, I just saw your, your message. I was... Okay, no worries. 
quickly cleaning up my dog just threw up so I was cleaning up that real quick but, <laughs> um, but yeah we can we can call things to order if we if we need to mm -hmm. I'm officially documenting that we're calling the meeting to order at 6 or 3 p.m. Uh, Vice Chairman. I'm sorry, I'm bringing up the agenda real quick. Matt, are you able to put the agenda on the screen? Yes, I'm working on that. That would help. <laughs> and while you, Matt is doing that, um, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, our council member liaison has joined the meeting, uh, council member Freelon. And so uh, if you don't mind, while Matt is pulling that up, if we could uh, uh, I'll introduce him uh, and then we can do some introductions uh, for the committee, if you don't mind. Uh, yes, please go for it. Okay, thank Let you. Let me con confirm that folks can see my screen right now. Yes, yes. no? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right, All right. I think I have uh, Yes all of the goodies in the background here so yeah this is the agenda and then i have the the meetings the minutes if we need to review those as well okay uh, thank you i'm gonna go ahead and uh, thank you matt mm -hmm. uh, members of the committee my mr vice chair uh, i would like to introduce uh our city council liaison to the citizens advisory committee uh as you know that uh, it is the practice of the city council to have a, a liaison from the city council appointed uh, to the different boards and commissions and our liaison was just appointed by uh, Mayor, Mayor Shule and is our newest city council member who we're greatly glad to have and receive uh, council member Freelon and so council member Freelon uh, we want to welcome you to the citizens advisory committee meeting. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be here. You're welcome. You're so welcome. Uh, well, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, Mr. Langloss is the Vice Chair, and he's, of course, presiding. I'm just kind of stepping in. Uh, but if the committee members would just uh, introduce themselves uh, for the council member, I would greatly appreciate it. And uh, I'll just start with the names. Uh, uh, Madam, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair. Um, yeah, uh, Brian Langloss. Um, I have now, I guess this is my first meeting as vice chair, uh, recently elected. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, and yeah, I've been in Durham now for eight years. Uh, started on this council a year ago or so, a little bit more now. Um, and then I, I work at Duke doing science policy work. So. Wonderful. Nice to meet you. Okay. And then we have our secretary, uh, Janice Washington. She's muted. Um, I'm muted. I'm sorry. I was just talking <laughs> away. <laughs> I was saying hi and welcome. Um, yes, this is my second term with the CAC. Um, I've been in Durham now for six years, and I also currently um, work at Duke as well. Wonderful to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. All right. Then I'll just go with uh, down the list as I'm seeing it, Dr. Monique. Hi, how are you? I'm well. Nice to meet you. Um, my name is Dr. Monique Cosley Hyman. I am um, an assistant professor of social work at North Carolina Central. I've been in Durham 14 years. Um, I'm on the DSS board, Durham Social Services. I'm the vice president of that board. I just got appointed to this board. I'm excited. I um, want to learn more and um, welcome. Okay, so you're new just like me, huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Nice to meet you. All right. Um, Ms. El Elhar Eberhardt, I'm sorry. You got it. Welcome. Um, my name is Rachel. This is my third month on the board. My affordable housing and urban planning, and I own a consultancy here in Durham. And I've been I've been in the Triangle for six years, and in Durham for one and a half. Wonderful. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Mr. Newman, 
Mr. Connell. Hey, Pierce. Good to see you again. I'm, uh, hey. Congratulations on your appointment to City Council. And Thank you. Glad to have you here. I just joined this committee, so I'm uh, excited to get a chance to work with you on this one. Great. Good to see you. Okay. Mr. Adam, I'm sorry I'm not pronouncing your last name. Sada. Yeah, Sada. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi. My name is Adam Sada, and I have been in Durham over six years and been a member of this board since last year, and I am an undergraduate student at UNCG in Greensboro. Welcome to the board. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Robbins. I'm Ashley Robbins. I've been on the board for a year now. Um, I've been in Durham for five years. I also work at Duke at Disability Services, and I'm excited to have you a part of City Council and a part of this board. Good to see you. Uh, Drew Helm. Drew, you're on mute. Go ahead. There we go. Are we good? Yeah, we good. Yeah. We okay. Um, I've been a part of CAC for like two and a half years now. I own a company here in Durham called Haven Developers, and we focus on affordable housing, um, real estate development, and architecture and construction. Um, and we're excited to have you involved. Thank you. All right. Mr. Rob Mang, I'm sorry, I'm getting ready to mess up your name. You're on mute. That's okay. Sorry. Uh, Romanian. I just, yeah. Uh, so I'm, uh, this is my third meeting. Uh, my name is Kia. I'm a PA in the area. I just graduated from Duke. Um, and been in the area for this is going on my third year. Great. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, Michelle, Miss Michelle. Hi there. I'm Michelle Ketchum. I'm with uh, I'm the owner of Acorn and Oak Property Management. Um, I've been in the area since 1996, and I've been a member of the CAC for a little over two years. And congratulations on your appointment. And I also want to say my dad is an architect and he oh. used to work for your dad at Freelon. Cool. That was cool. one of the reasons we came down here actually um, from Michigan. So glad to have you uh, as part of our committee. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, does that include uh, all, all of the uh, CAC members? Uh, great. Can we get uh, Mr. Newman? Is he on? I think so. We did. We did get me. Okay. All right. Super. Super. Then we'll go to our uh, staff, uh, Will McConyers. You're on mute, Wilma. Trying this again. All right. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome and congratulations, Council um, Freelon. We're certainly excited about having you. My name is Wilma Conyers, and I am uh, programs coordinator you know, and or planning and performance administrator with the Department of Community Development. I've been with the city of Durham um, since 2008. So again, welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, Matt Schnarr is also with staff. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Schnarr. I'm the planning and performance manager with uh, community development, city of Durham. All right. Super. And uh, I think we have somebody, I was thinking somebody was coming in, uh, but I'm Reginald Johnson. This is, oh, sorry, this is. Go ahead, go ahead. Go Alicia ahead. Smith Freshwater, sorry I'm late. No, that's all right. This is Alicia Smith Freshwater. Nice to see you. All right. And then we have uh, our chair just stepped in uh, to, the, to the meeting, uh, LaVon Barnes. Uh, Mr. Barnes, we are introducing ourselves to the uh, council member Freelon uh, CAC uh, liaison. Yes, sir. How's everybody doing? Hopefully everybody's doing well. Uh, Pierce, it's good to see you. Good My to name see is you LeVon too, bro. Barnes. My name is LaVon Barnes, if you did not know. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I happen to be uh, the chair of this um, group of great people, and I uh, appreciate you being First of all, congratulations on your appointment, and as well as being the liaison between the council and our board, we really uh, look forward to working with you. Thank you. All right. 
And uh, I think that includes everyone. I'm Reginald Johnson. I serve as director of the Department of Community Development, have been so since uh, 2011. And uh, I'm the chief staff person uh, to the Citizens Advisory Committee. And so welcome to the Citizens Advisory Committee and congratulations on your appointment. Thank you. All right. With that, I'll turn it back over to the uh, vice chair or the chair who, whichever one is presiding to run the rest of the meeting. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, <laughs> well, Brian, I, it's, it's up to you. I mean, you were in the meeting on uh, on time, and I wasn't. Um, if you want me to do it, I'll do it. It's not a problem. Uh, uh, I mean, it's up to you. If you're driving, I don't want to distract I'm not, you. I'm not driving. I'm, I'm actually I'm not driving at all. Park. Um, all right. I will, so I, I will let you handle it then, if you want to. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, I apologize for being late. I just kind of left an event with uh, hopefully our future vice president. Uh, Kamala Harris, and that's why I was late. Uh, I am going to call this meeting into order, and I will. I, I guess we have not done the minutes yet, so if we have not um, approved the minutes yet, I would like to receive a motion to approve the minutes for August. So moved. Second. So I, I see I got to move in a second. All those in favor, any discussion, any unreadiness on that? Hear none. All those in favor of approving August's minutes, say aye. 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 All those opposed, there should be none. Um, Ms. Washington, do we have enough for quorum today? Yes, we do. And I just need to um, identify who made the second motion to um, Monique Hyman. Dr. Hyman. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Awesome. Um, and I would like to put on the record that uh, Ebony West uh, did contact me and she was unable to meet, make the meeting today so we can put her as an excused absence. Okay, I will then turn it over to Mr. Johnson for the consolidated plan updates or was that, no, that was Matt, I'm sorry. I'm gonna turn it over to Matt for the consolidated plan updates. And I think I'm gonna pitch that to Wilmer. Right. Okay. <laughs> We're pitching it. All right, pitching it. Hey, exactly. <laughs> um, so this will be very um, brief unless there are some questions. So we all aware that um, the city of Durham, like other grantees, have to submit a five-year consolidated plan um, when it's applicable. And it was applicable for us to submit our 2020-2025 consolidated plan. And in addition to the consolidated plan, we also annually have to submit an annual action plan. So our annual action plan is for FY 2020, 2021. So with all that said, the plan um, was submitted to HUD on or about June 6th. And we are pleased to share with you that our consolidated plan along with our annual action plan has been approved by HUD that happened um, recently, maybe a week or two ago. Um, in addition to that, so what that means, one, that HUD has approved the um, plans that we project on how to expend at least our upcoming 2020-21 um, formula grants. And we are aware that we receive um, four entitlement grants. And not only has the um, consolidated plan and the annual action plan has been approved by HUD. The wonderful thing also is that the money is in the bank. So those four entitlement grants are now sitting in our line of credit um, ready to spend. Um, unless there are some questions, I'm going to yield the balance of my time to the next agenda item. Ms. Conyers. Oh, Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to open up the floor for, for, for questions, so go ahead. Yeah, Rachel's got a question. Um, the, the consolidated plan, is that completed in-house or is that contracted out? Um, typically, we um, acquired the assistance of a consultant to assist us with um, developing the consolidated plan. The annual action plan is done in-house by staff. Okay. On a regular basis, along unless it's consistent with the time frame when the consolidated plan is due. Does that make sense? It 
if it yes. doesn't say so. So because we have a consolidated plan to do, and that um, in addition, we have to have an annual action plan. So because we had a five-year plan, our annual action plan was also a part of the five-year consolidated plan. Moving forward for 2021, 22, and the next annual plans that are absent of a consolidated plan, it's developed in-house by staff. Does that help? It does, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions? All right, well, we'll move into our uh, agenda item number four. I will then now turn it over to our director, Mr. Reginald Johnson. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I just have uh, two uh, brief items to share. Uh, as you know, the uh, uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development has uh, issued uh, special funds under some of the entitlement programs for uh, COVID-19 relief funds. Uh, we did receive a letter uh, two weeks ago that for phase three of CDBG, the city is going to be awarded uh, 1.5, additional $1.5 million uh, in addition to the money that we for CDBG that we've already been awarded. Uh, we have not uh, developed a plan for determining uh, how that money will be used based upon the needs. It has to be COVID related, uh, but we're going to set about a process for that. Just to refresh your memory, if you will recall that about uh, just over a million dollars uh, was allocated to Department of Social Services uh, in a contract with social services to do uh, uh, rent relief uh, to help folks with their relief rent uh, due to COVID. So that was the first phase. The second phase of CDBG fundings went to the states. Then the third phase uh, comes to uh, city governments. That's how we're getting another $1.5 million. So we'll keep you uh, abreast on that. Then the second part of that also related to COVID-19, uh, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development has a, awarded an additional about $2 million in emergency solutions grants, which is going to be one of the subjects that we're going to talk about a little bit later today and the uh, Homeless Services Advisory Committee, subcommittee, and some providers are having conversations about how that best can be deployed into the homeless uh, infrastructure uh, in a way that uh, also has to be, has some COVID-19 related. Uh, and the groups are meeting now um, and uh, we should have, you know, maybe in another month or so, the recommendations uh, from the community uh, providers on how they want to uh, approach the uh, additional resources that we are getting. The third thing that I'll mention is that one of the things we talked with the executive committee of the CAC about was how to uh, have CAC members more involved uh, in the uh, grants process. One of the things that we're looking at and we are actually doing is to make sure uh, that when we have opportunity to include CAC members on the review process as panelists uh, to review the uh, competition and review the applications. And so I know that uh, a couple of members of the CAC uh, have already done that and I was hoping that I could serve as a segue into the next agenda item where they can talk about their experience uh, serving as a review uh, panelist and, and provide some insight to others. One to be just honest to encourage others to say yes when we ask, uh, but also to show how uh, this does have an uh, impact uh, and a positive uh, contribution to the work that we're doing. And so we have also been asked by your chair to come up with some additional ways. And so we'll be at a future made, uh, meeting making some recommendations uh, on that. So if the, for those who have served on panels, if you would just share a little bit with the group uh, about the panel you served on and your experience, I greatly appreciate it. That leads us to the next agenda item anyway, so that that'll, that's a good segue. Um, so those, yeah, so those members who have already served on the panel, uh, I would like to give you guys some uh, time to be able to express your thoughts on that. Hey, Levon, this is Carl. Uh, actually, I, I was one of those members, but can I go back for just one second? I want to make sure I got something straight, Reginald. Um, 
I think we talked in a prior meeting about how we were getting a bunch of extra money in ESG and CDBG because of the CARES Act. It's the million and a half, the two million that you just mentioned. That's the money we've already talked about, right? It's like our annual allotment would have been about three and a half million and now it's gonna be closer to seven is sort of what I remember, right? Uh, that sounds about right. The numbers okay. that I gave you were the correct numbers of additional funding. Got it, got it. Yeah, and my, my memory was that we talked about in the last meeting or two meetings ago even that the CARES Act money roughly doubled our annual amount. Um, so that, that, that sounds right to me. Uh, I, I did serve on a, a panel to do one of the lead RFPs and, and I will commend my fellow CAC members. Uh, it is not a huge time commitment to do um, and I enjoyed getting a chance to talk to the staff members who had done the rest of it uh, and sort of walk through with Matt, you know, the scores and where there were maybe some discrepancies. Uh, I think we all learned together that I am much harder on the bidders than uh, other folks, but I was consistently much harder, so it didn't screw up the scores. Um, so I hope you know you'll uh, you'll all participate. It, it really is kind of interesting to to get to talk through with the staff members on some of those grant um, you know and contract decisions. So this is Janice. I also served on the um, lead and healthy homes program, the RFP for um, they were seeking a, they would receive their award for the lead based paint um, hazardous reduction program. Um, and just I've just basically shared the same sentiments that Carl, Carl just shared. Um, it wasn't too labor intensive. Um, one of the our, one of the applications were rather lengthy, but you know I did enjoy just reading through it and then you know scoring and coming together with the staff. Um, just to go through the just to go through the scores and have that discussion, which was really helpful. I appreciate the transparency. David to, um, was given provided the information that the actual um, grantees were were giving and able to have that as a document, kind of to read through and kind of kind of help really follow through with the grant application itself. Um, that was that that we had to read through. It just made it a little easier to follow through and to kind of understand what they were looking for. I too probably scored more harshly than the staff did, but I was also consistent in that. But it was a it was a good um, it was a good um, experience to actually go through that process, and I actually look forward to having if if opportunity presents itself to actually do it do it again. Um, I just appreciate having the opportunity and the insight kind of the of the process and how awards are granted. Uh, well, thank y'all both for doing some extra duties. Um, we, yeah, like Mr. Johnson said, I encourage all of us to be involved as much as we can um, because we, I think this board brings some critical insight to a lot of the, to a lot of things that are gonna be happening in, in this county, um, especially with, especially with um, you know, homelessness and housing. I think it's going to be critical, which uh, I became officially appointed to the Affordable Housing Implementation Board. I think that's the name, long-winded board, um, representing the CSC uh, as that as a member. Um, and so I will be reporting back to this body as that board continues to um, get put together um, about where that affordable housing bond money is going um, and how it's being implemented. So I look forward to, to serving that. So um, I'm going to go ahead and go right in. Go right into ESG. Mr. Chair, is that correct? I think we lost you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, can you hear? I was talking to myself. Mute. Yeah, we lost you there for a second. Yeah, I'm over here talking to myself. I wish somebody <laughs> would say something. Uh, I was saying that I encourage everybody to be a part of different panels like Mr. Johnson was saying. I appreciate Carl and Janice for um, stepping up and being a part of that particular panel. I think as we go forward, uh, our board is critical when it comes to having certain insight. Um, we understand that we're gonna have a, a housing situation and, and, and homeless situation coming up here as we get into um, the winter months after the um, moratorium ends for evictions. And so I think that we need to all be um, forthcoming and trying to join as many panels as we can. Uh, and I was saying that I officially was appointed to the uh, Affordable Housing Implementation Board. I think that's what the name of the board is. 
and um, I will be bringing reports back to this body uh, in regards to that, since I'm the representative for the CAC on that particular board. Uh, now we can go right into emergency so ESG grants with Matt. I think Matt, are you doing it, or am I putting it to woman? That's, that's right. Know. Okay. No, nope. so it, it's it, it's all me now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And give me just a second to pull this PowerPoint up. And uh, just a, one other comment before I start this uh, ESG presentation. I just uh, also want to kind of just thank uh, the members who assisted with the two RFPs, lead RFPs. Uh, and I also want to note that we do, we actually had four lead RFPs and we had four volunteers from the CAC that were going to assist with all four of those. It just so happened that two of the four, we did not have enough responses. Um, and so we had to reissue those and those have been reissued and will be um, processed, uh, uh, evaluated at the end of October. So I, I can't remember exactly which two other members had agreed to assist, but uh, we hope that, hope that you would agree to uh, help us with those two, those two that we had to reissue as well. And it was, a, I think, a good experience for, uh, for us as well, just getting the outside perspective from, from the community, from you, from you CAC members. So um, let me just uh, pull this on slideshow. Can everyone see my screen or just give me a yay, nay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, so once again, everyone, my name is Matt Schnars. I'm the Planning and Performance Manager, and uh, I'm going to just briefly review one of uh, four entitlement programs that uh, that we uh, administer in community development. Uh, and this program is called the Emergency Solutions Grant, or for short, we abbreviate it as ESG. So just briefly, what we're gonna try to touch on um, is just give you an overview, high level overview of, of the Emergency Solutions Grant, um, you know, what it is, a little bit about the, uh, the Hearth Act, uh, and then give you a sense of what's the target population for this, this program. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the funding and the funded organizations. Uh, I know this, that's one thing that, that came, um, uh, that one of the questions that Mr. Mr. Uh, the chair had uh, mentioned, kind of knowing a little bit more about, you know, funding and which organizations are, are, are funded by some of the programs and sort of getting a little bit more granular into the process. So I got a couple slides that might help with some of that as it relates to ESG. Uh, and then I have a, a, just a brief reporting summary. There's a lot of information um, that is reported, required to be reported. Uh, and I just have a brief slide about that. And then we'll just close it out with some questions and answers and you know, have some open dialogue as we have time. So what is ESG? So ESG stands for Emergency Solutions Grant. And of our four entitlement programs, uh, it's the smallest in terms of the annual funding amount, it's the smallest of our four. Uh, and this program is a program that targets people experiencing homelessness. And there were some substantial changes in what the program was, is, was able to do. Uh, and this occurred in 2011 as a result of something called the Hearth Act. Uh, and so basically what happened in 2011 is that the, the ability to use this, this ESG funding to do more than what it was originally doing um, happened in 2011. In 2011, uh, before 2011, it was primarily used to support um, uh, shelter operations, and it still is used to support shelter operations in some cases. Um, but in 2011, they shifted it so that it could do a little bit more in terms of homeless prevention uh, and helping people become rehoused into their own apartments. So what does ESG do? So there's... Um, six sort of categories of service that ESG is, is allowed to do under the regulations. Uh, the first one is called street outreach. And street outreach uh, is you know, basically having paying staff persons uh, to go out into the community and engage people that are living unsheltered, uh, maybe living under, a, you know, under an overpass or 
railroad tracks or out in the woods, the idea is that we want to have the ability with street outreach to be able to go out and engage folks, build relationships, and hopefully um, bring them into shelter or have them become housed uh, out of those unsheltered situations. Uh, emergency shelter is typically, um, you know, what it essentially what it says. It's it's having an emergency shelter for people to go and stay. And this could be congregate shelters, and this could also be funding that might, in some communities, is used to uh, uh, pay for hotel or motel stays for a short period of time. And that occurs if there's not good capacity in the shelter system. Fortunately, in Durham, we do have fairly good capacity. Um, and uh, it's not to say that we don't need more, but in Durham, it's not something that we use um, this funding to do to pay for motels in most cases. And then homeless prevention. Homeless prevention is um, the the idea is that you prevent somebody from becoming homeless if, uh, if they get an eviction notice, uh, for example, uh, and they could stay in their apartment if they need if they had some additional funding or a short period of support, case management. Um, that's what home, homeless prevention provides. And then rapid rehousing is the, the program component that in Durham we've most invested in, in terms of our uh, entitlement allocation. Rapid rehousing, essentially what that does is help people find a locate an apartment um, and a landlord that they would rent to, um, help them rent that apartment and give them a short-term subsidy um, and also case support, um, life skills development, um, help them sort of navigate, you know, maintaining that, that housing over time. And then they are able to, the idea is that they hopefully are able to have that lease be in their name and that they can sustain it um, after they are finished with the program. And then there's two other components that are, are not necessarily considered maybe direct service components, but there's something called homeless management information system that we'll talk a little bit about later on in the presentation. Uh, and that's essentially a, 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 a database that's required that we use that the community uses. Um, and then the administrative grantee administration is the amount that the, uh, the city is the grantee, city of Durham is the grantee is allowed to take 3% of the total grant amount to, to um, pay for the administration of the grant. Matt, Matt. Yes. Um, yes. With regard to ESG, mm -hmm. with um, as it relates to grantee admin, mm -hmm. I believe that's seven point five. I believe you're right. That is right. Okay. Seven. All right. Good catch. So I got my I got my uh, amounts confused. That it should be seven point five. You're right. Okay, so who is eligible for the assistance? The persons experiencing homelessness, um, the, the pe people that are experiencing homeless that are actively homeless, homeless uh, and they are, can be served by the street outreach component, emergency shelter component, and rapid rehousing component. And then people that are considered at risk of becoming homeless are eligible for the homeless prevention component. So uh, the two of the uh, three of the, the four components, you have to be actually actually homeless. And so what does, this is a, a question that comes up uh, is, is around sort of defining homeless, homelessness and more importantly, eligibility as, as it relates to this program. And there's typically a lot of uh, kind of confusion about defining who is homeless and then who is eligible to um, be served by these programs and who is counted as homeless. And so this is kind of the HUD um, definition of homelessness, homelessness under ESG. And that is an individual or family who lacks a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, which means that they have a primary nighttime residence that is a public or private place not meant for human habitation. Essentially, that's an example of living out, you know, under bridges or living in some unsheltered um, location. Two uh, is living in a publicly or privately operated shelter designated to provide temporary living arrangements. This is like congregate shelters, transitional housing programs, hotels and motels, um, or charitable organizations that are paid by state or local funds to help house people that are homeless in shelter. 
Or number three, that if a person is exiting an institution where uh, he or she has resided for 90 days or less and who resided in an emergency shelter or place not meant for human habitation immediately before entering that institution. So that's kind of a kind of a mouthful, but this is very important because with this program, um, any any organization that is funded with ESG that the city um, supports with these dollars, there's a, a, a relatively stringent guidelines around them making sure that people meet this definition and and, and are um, documented that they are are in these one of these sort of categories of, of locations of living um, to be eligible for these programs and services. So um, we can uh, provide a, a additional information about that if there are questions. So how much ESG funding does Durham receive? So this is just a little bit of a historical um, uh, representation of the amounts that Durham has received over time. Once again, this is just ESG. Uh, and so in 2010, we were at about an $85,000 annual allocation. As I mentioned in, in 2011, the Hearth Act uh, increased that a little bit. Uh, and, and that was also after the, the housing crisis, the, the, um, the funding had a bump there. It bumped down a little bit in 2013, and then it's been a little bit of a, a steady um, increase since then. And the most recent uh, allocation in 2020 was uh, 174, $174,691. That just gives you a sense of the, the dollar amount. So that's, if you think about the, uh, what we're talking about with people experiencing homelessness, this is not a lot of money for you know just our community. And once again, this is just this is just our annual what's called the entitlement amount. So this does not speak to um, what what was referenced earlier about the the COVID money or the, the CARES Act funding. Um, this is just sort of the annual regular funding amount for ESG. And then just briefly, which organizations have received the funding? So I just did a, a brief summary over the last few years of which organizations have received the, the funding and, and the amounts that they've received. For the most part, it's a relatively small number of organizations that receive the funding. Uh, and that's not to say that, that this isn't something that, uh, um, that other organizations aren't, can't actually apply for and receive this, this funding. One of the challenges has been is actually we have a very few number of organizations that have have shown interest and willingness to to apply for the funding, and hence the there's a you know more limited number of organizations that are are showing on the screen as funded. Um, another another factor that is uh, worth mentioning uh, for for this is that there are strings attached. There are strings attached with these dollars, and by that I mean uh, you know there's uh, some pretty uh, so pretty stringent requirements for tracking, reporting, uh, and um, that, that sometimes limits the number of organizations that are interested and able to, to apply for this you know, relatively small amount of funding. So um, that gives you a sense of where, where the dollars go in terms of the organizations in the community. So I'm either doing really good or people can't hear me, hopefully. Uh, on track. Well, well man, I, I do have a question. I was going to wait to the end, but since you put All it right, out there. All right, thank you. <laughs> since, thank since you. Since you put it Washington out there. You, you, yeah, go ahead. You said, you, so you said that there is, you know, stringent reporting that takes place as far as tracking and then reporting yeah. out. And that's probably limited yep. the number of organizations that apply for the funding. Um, is the reporting, mm -hmm. is the requirements, is that based on what HUD has said? Is that based on what the city, or is it a combination of both? I have two questions. That's my first question. It's, yeah, it's, I would say it's HUD. It's 100% okay. um, HUD. And, and I mean, we as the city are an agent of HUD in that, you know, we are the grantee. The city is the grantee of the funds. And then we have to interpret what's required for each of the funding sources, ESG being one of four, and administer those um, accordingly. Um, we've actually had a little bit of a challenge because we've had out, we've had organizations that recently that we've uh, funded and have, they've they've decided that it was a little bit too too stringent for what 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 they um, received to to uh, administer the funds. So there's a 
a growing number of requirements, especially around homeless management information system that make things, it, it, it's well intended, but it makes things a little bit more difficult for some of the organizations to track and monitor what they do. Okay, and so then my, my second question, it. my second question is, so is this something that, um, do you know if there's been any discussion about it not being so complicated? Because I'm quickly, I, I, immediately I thought about some organizations, just especially during the season, that I remember getting a notification. There was 28 unsheltered families um, that was actually had been identified living in the, living in the sleeping in the woods or in their cars. Um, and these were also Durham mm -hmm. um, um, Durham County Durham City students. So these were actually students. And so this was McKinley. Mm -hmm. um, Vento program that was looking for funding. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and so they reached out mm -hmm. to a lot of community, um, which they got a good response. But I was just curious about would they be one that could potentially get assistance? And maybe they maybe they apply or haven't applied, or maybe there's a reason why they haven't. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking in my mind: if you have 28 un unsheltered families sleeping that you've identified sleeping in their cars or, or in the woods, that mm -hmm. as far as this has been emergency funding. Is there a way that, do you know if they have they applied for any funding? Let me first ask you that. I have no, I, I have no idea about any individual uh, okay. You okay. Know, households that, yeah, I have no idea about that. So that's, okay. That's not something. I that was just curious that if that, if that program, about. yeah, I was just curious if that program had reached out for any of this funding because in my mind immediately, if you're having to reach out to the community because it's an urgent need, and then here the city has mm -hmm. the funding for emergency solution to assist with that. It seemed like there's a disconnect um, in my opinion. So I was curious about that. Yeah, and, and what you described is is the, the the population that sort of is the first priority is what you just described. If you're living in your car or you're really in a situation where you are what this is termed often the, the the language that's used is called unsheltered, that they should be prioritized for this relatively small amount of funding. Now, one of the challenges sometimes is that, that they're not necessarily always going to be sort of very easy to locate or may not want to necessarily be uh, known that they're living in their car because of different reasons. Now, if they are with the, you had mentioned McKinney Vento, that suggests that maybe they're connected with a school, you know, that they're either in school Right. connected with someone from the school system yeah and so one of the other pieces is is being able and I, I do know that the school system does have a connection with uh, you know the homeless housing providers programs I, I can't tell you I can't speak to specifics about what those relationships are but it's it is something that's required as part of this the HUD funding piece is that there is a connection to the McKinney Vento program the McKinney Vento program is somewhat of a parallel program that's funded through the um, Department of Education. Um, the challenge is with McKinney-Vento, that portion of the funding that supports the Department of Education, that's the school systems basically, they can't use that funding to help people pay rent, for example. That funding can help, you know, support, right. yeah, helping them, but doesn't like get them shelter per se. The idea is that they need to be able to get connected to, you know, this program or these providers. Does that help? Okay. I, again, I was just curious about that because I know there were several people who wrote checks from, you know, just people who got the notice who wrote checks just to put these people in, in hotels for yeah. a week or two weeks. So I was just curious about, you know, why. And it seems that this is something that happens often, especially with kids who are in, in Durham public schools. Um, families um, seem, seem to deal with homelessness often that I'm just surprised that they're not listed here. So, okay. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, it may be if you wouldn't mind maybe offline, if you could send me an email or I could sure. uh, I could get you connected to, we do have part of our, our department, we do have uh, a team that, that is more, uh, that, that is more connected with the homeless housing system and, and is their role is to directly kind of support the system. They, you know, the one thing to keep in mind is we don't, the city doesn't directly operate any programs or services, but we are in charge of facilitating sort of process and, and system-wide evaluation planning. Um, so we do have a team of folks that I'd be uh, interested to get, at least have you have some connection there. If you do have, sometimes you may have this knowledge and it, it just may be that the connection is not made to what maybe they need. So there, there's maybe some opportunity there. I can follow up with you. Sure, thank you. Okay. Can I ask yes, a question? This is uh, Dr. Yes, Hyman. 
-hmm. Does it have to be in terms of applying for the funding? Do you have to be a social service agency? Does it have to be? And it could be a silly question, but I'm just asking. Uh, no, it's not required that you're a social service agency. Uh, you can be a non nonprofit. Um, they actually just recently changed the regulations that the housing authority could potentially apply for some of this funding, um, or it can be a government agency. Uh, in, in Durham's case, it's it's all nonprofits currently that receive the funding. Um, and, and so some uh, of it also, but, I think you highlighted like preventive services, because I was just thinking about yeah, homeless prevention. Um, homeless Home, yeah, and I was just thinking about like just some of the different um, schools, social work schools. I don't mm -hmm. know if they could apply for this. You know, I'm not Maybe sure so. about schools. That's that's uh, you know, I don't know if uh, you know a, a school could apply for this funding. I, that's something I've never I've never heard about, or and I don't know what the regulations would uh, require. But that's something we could check on and, and follow up to let you know if that's something that, that is possible. You know, like one of my one of my colleagues got a grant around mental health. So she's doing things around mm -hmm. mental health and mental health training. So I was just wondering, you know, if we if, if you know, some of the social work schools, if they wanted to apply for this grant to do, I'm thinking more about the prevention piece, the homeless prevention. Mm -hmm. you know, like that. Yeah. Yeah, now just keep in mind these when you know homeless prevention in this sort of this sort of realm is is you're administering the dollars for the most part for for paying rent or you you know assisting with utilities that were unpaid and that there is money that can be used for the kind of the pay the case manager for that but the idea that, that. The, the idea was right this is these are housing dollars because it's you know we're kind of in the housing space and so a lot of times the challenge is that there's a there's a challenge with sort of okay well you have to have some trained staff to do that work and you can use this money for some of that but there's not a lot of money there yep. okay so i'm going to move on here almost towards the end which organizations receive funding and then the other th thing that i thought that i would just speak a little bit about is okay well that's all well and good how do we pra how do we track the progress for this program for esg and so there's, uh, I had mentioned earlier, there's something called Homeless Management Information System, HMIS is the acronym that's, that we use. Uh, and what this is, is this a, is a very complex database that is uh, developed and managed by third party vendors um, that we, um, we work with. There's a software vendor that develops the software platform and then with, there's a third party vendor that helps us manage and train people how to use it. Um, and this is something that is required and has been required for about 13 years by the Department of Housing and Urban Development for ESG. And this is something that is, is very much changes every year. Literally, there's, there's new what they call data elements every year that are added to this. And it's, uh, uh, it, it, it really has allowed, uh, I think, a much deeper insight across the country into what, what's happening in the community and, and what progress is being made. Uh, and so that is um, homeless management information system. And then from homeless management information system, there's a new system that's, well, it's relatively new within the last three years called SAGE. And this is the HMIS reporting repository. And so this uh, database HMIS is, is, has uh, uh, the ability to create a, a up, upload an encrypted file from their, their, that system into this reporting repository. repository. And what that does is that allows us to uh, generate aggregate reports for ESG, which is which is then submitted to HUD in, in a you know kind of a, a raw file format, and uh, that's something that that is is allowing. It, it's still fair, Sage is still fairly new, but Sage was created because you know the HMIS system is so massive and so complex um, that there has to be a way to sort of like just tell me, you know, high level numbers that are being served and, and uh, sort of outcomes of the program. And so just, a, I just pulled a, a, just a high level summary of the 2018, 2019 CAPER, summer, uh, CAPER report summary. So CAPER for, the, for um, members that maybe are new is uh, the Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report. It's the annual report that we have to do um, for all of our entitlement programs. Uh, and so this is the, just the uh, high level numbers of people that are served, that were served by ESG over the past, uh, the most recent 
paper report. Uh, and so this just gives sort of uh, some high level numbers. So total number of persons served 482. And of that, there are, many of them are young children. So this is uh, something that sort of highlights the example that Ms. Washington was, was talking about earlier, that, that there are many families that are served in this program and many families that are in need in, in Durham. Uh, so of the, you know, of the 482, it looks 280 or under age 18. Under age 18. Uh, so that just gives kind of a brief high level summary and I'm glad to share this, uh, share this PowerPoint with, uh, with the members after the session and answer questions as well. Uh, Matt, right now, and I'll just go ahead and end right there. Yes. Matt, can you talk a little bit on the HMIS sure. system? One of the challenges is that the, the HMIS and participation in it, which means if I receive funding, I'm entering data about particular individuals, and it is complex. And what happens is that uh, usually an agency has to be of some size to be able to spare a person to, to invest in the expertise. So that's where you get that's into a very good point. your uh, smaller organizations uh, because they're, of course, you know, I use the language running from pillar to post that they don't have the, the, the uh, time or to invest in the person to train, get the training. And that causes some challenges on our end. I would say, for example, even, and it doesn't have to be small organizations, it can be our shelter, for example. Uh, one of the things uh, the shelter here does have, has had some challenges with HMIS because, of course, the challenges that they have, everybody's covering somebody and taking care of a responsibility, but they don't always have the, the person who's trained to be able to enter the data about the homeless person uh, in the in the HMIS system, HMIS system, which causes some challenges uh, for us from a hub perspective. So I just wanted to that's, share. That. That's a very yeah, very good point. Yes, very good point. That's yeah. You're trying to help people that are in crisis, and many times the shelters are you know bare bones in terms of staffing, as it is, and 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 now, you know, have to spend a. a increasingly a considerable amount of time making sure that they are recording all of the information about the person's situation and about you know sort of where they've been and what their needs are in a in a system and that's at the beginning and during and after they, they leave a different pro, a different program so that is something that it's a very good point uh, mr johnson matt let me let me make sure i understood that part um yes, sir. It, it sounds like one of the reasons why organizations can't do it is the reporting burden. The, the grant itself also doesn't help support the salary of a person to administer the grant. Is that about right? That's so right. I get 40,000 for urban ministries, but it doesn't help me support the salary of a grant administrator to actually like do all the compliance, then it's not really worth the, right. the grant because I'm not going to have anybody compliance. Okay. That's right. That's right. I mean, it, it can pay. It can this this month, this funding can pay for a case manager or case pay for some case management. But keep in mind the annual the total annual amount is one hundred seventy four thousand. So it's not going to pay for a lot of case managers. And then you have to weigh that with, uh, you know, HUD wants the money to mostly be supporting them, supporting people that are in need for housing, and whether that's paying for the shelter to keep the lights on and you know, keep the heat on and or to help pay for uh, uh, some rent on their the apartment for a couple of months or to get the utilities started. That's where, you know, HUD wants this money to be um, sort of uh, invested. So yeah, so it does it does create a challenge. And it's not that the I'd say it's, you know, the organizations that we do work with that, uh, you know, we're on the slide that previous slide, most of them, I think, do the best they can. But it's, uh, you know it is it is a challenge and and i think hud has has very well very good intentions in, in making some of what they're requiring to be tracked this is very well intentioned it has to be done it's just the capacity to to do it at the level that is is now expected is is, is becoming a challenge for many communities not just there so um this is Monique again so while i think that that it really is good in terms of helping the homeless population with that. But I also, I guess, you know, my passion is also trying to educate them around 
how do we get them to go from needing the services in terms of the money, right? To being able to mm -hmm. find a place to be, able to be, you know, stable. And so I think sometimes mm -hmm. we kind of just put a bandaid on it. So we give them the money, but then how do we help them to learn how to, you know, whatever money they do have to budget it, to be able to find a place if they can within their means. Am I making sense of mm -hmm. just my social work? Now? Yeah. No, <laughs> so. you're, you're right on target. You're right on target. No, that's right. Yeah. How do, how do we build the, you know, that they, the capacity so that they can sustain themselves and it's, right. you know, it's easier. So said perfect than done. example, I have, I have a student in one of my other lives that I do some consultant work with um, and field. Mm -hmm. And so she told me yesterday, she was like, I have a student, I have a, a family that was in a homeless shelter. Now they have an apartment. The, I forgot the program that she's working with, um, but they have like, they can't, they, they, I think the program is giving the family $400, but in another two months, mm -hmm. they're going to have to pay the whole 850, right? So I said mm -hmm. to them, I said to the student, why don't you just have them pay the whole, like try to like budget and do the 850 now, because what happens is they used to you giving that 400, how are they going to do the 850? They're back to, they're going to be back to being homeless. You know what I mean? So like, it's just, yeah. I don't know. Yep. Yeah, it's it's probably this 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 uh, number four on the screen here, rapid rehousing. That's kind of that model, um, that model that basically is is short term rental assistance. And the idea is that you would get some case management, some life skills, kind of some support, some of the support that you're describing in a relatively short amount of time. And and so the the challenge sometimes is that not every household that's not appropriate for every household. Some households may need much, much longer and much deeper support than what this, this program component can do. But then one of the challenges is there's what else, you know, what else is there? If you don't have, let's say a, a housing choice voucher, a section eight voucher available, it's uh, it, it sometimes can be a bridge, but it's a, yeah, it is, it is a challenge. It may not be appropriate for every household and it may not be enough money, but the reality is that's what, um, the programs that, that are funded through this ESG, that's what they're required to do. Um, so the issue is when they don't have that $400 again, how do they afford, you know, afford that 850, you know? Yeah. yeah. What yeah. happens? Yeah. So that's, that's really kind of, yep. That's important. Good, Mr. Johnson. Yeah. So I would say one of the things your executive uh, leadership has talked about is to have us to bring in some of the uh, uh, nonprofits because they actually touch the people and talk about their work in detail yeah. uh, about uh, how they interact uh, with, with individuals. And I understand clearly what you're saying because it's definitely case management. To be quite frank about it, a lot of the funds that's coming out of housing uh, in the US Department of Housing and Urban Development are not necessarily case management funds, they're housing mm -hmm. funds. And that's one another challenges. That's the reason a lot of times some of our money goes to the Department of Social Services because they can combine the money we have for housing with other money that they receive for services. And that's a challenge that the, citizen, the uh, continuum of care has. That's all of the entities that work to end homelessness because a lot of persons who have challenges with homelessness also have other challenges that uh, are whether it's mental health, whether it's addiction, whether it's uh, management, uh, fa uh, financial management. There's a range of things that require uh, non-housing sources of funds to be able to fund. And how do you combine those? And those are one of the challenges that we work with every day that we, we kind of have to, to, to bridge. Uh, but that's one of the things that you know, we're going to work on is bringing some individuals in to actually see how that lands and how that touches the ground and touches individuals. Hope that makes sense. And Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of those um, nonprofits that uh, were on the list do receive multiple funds from community development through our other grants. Now, what paying? Uh, I, I would not, I would not just, I, I'm not sure I'd say that. Um, yeah, what I was showing was just, just narrowly scoped to ESG. There may be some that, that receive other funding, but uh, well, I, I just know some like sure. familiar names like Urban Ministries, and I know that Urban yeah. Ministries like families in New Hope. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I, I, I've seen those. We see them in other grants that we um, mm -hmm. uh, award. Evaluate. And so I'm mm -hmm. just trying to, yeah, evaluate, and I'm just trying to figure out whether or not they're able to combine. You know, the, the focus on having 
somebody to run and manage their HMI system uh, and knowing that the money that they may get is not even going to come close to being able to, to pay somebody to do that work, whether or not they mm-hmm. do they combine yeah. funds from other grants that they may be awarded to be able to pay for staff in that way. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to, I, I couldn't tell you for sure. I think what Mr. Johnson, uh, you know, mentioned that we did, we did talk about at some point, maybe scheduling some time to actually have some of the organizations be in front of the board to answer some of these more granular questions. That probably would be the, the best uh, approach. I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to sort of guess as, as to what they should or could or are doing necessarily. Um, but those are good, yeah, very good ideas. Yeah, very good thoughts, questions. So, uh, Matt, have have you seen any applications both for um, the ESG funds and home? Um, you mean applications that that organizations that applied for both? For you, correct, you mean? yeah, yeah, organizations that apply for both funds. I'm not. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I I would. Uh, defer to Ms. Conyers or Mr. Johnson to, to um, say otherwise. But. It, it's been a moment, but if I were to um, think back, and Mr. Johnson may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, we had, um, I think we allocated funding to housing for New Hope. It was that a new development or a revive? That's, yeah, you're right. Cole that's, you're right. that's the one right. time that I can think about in the course of probably the last five years where an organization received ESG as well as home. So that's an example. Good memory, Ms. Conyers. Mm-hmm. Are there any other questions for Matt? Uh, this is Ms. Conyers. I don't have any questions, but I'd just like to add for the sake of um, the discussion regarding ESG, if you're having trouble getting to sleep at night and um, you need an aid, the ESG regulations are found at 24 CFR, that's Code of Federal Regulations, 576. Thank you. (laughs) Thank thank you. Um, Somebody go Google that. (laughs) Somebody Google that that, that code. Um, Any other questions for or comments um, for Matt? about ESG grants. Matt, I appreciate, um, again, your assertiveness uh, in explaining to our group, um, you know, about the different grants. And sure. We still have a couple more that we have to go through, um, but I think um, staff has done such a great job of explaining things to us. So I appreciate you guys. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Sure. All right. We got... Before I go to the discussions, I'm going to amend. Uh, I'm going to allow Miss, if Miss Smith Freshwater is still on the line, I think she. Are you back? Is Alicia back? There she goes. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I I can. Yes. I can hear you. Um. So I'm going to turn the. Can y'all hear me? You have a you have a little yes yeah you have a little bit of a lag but yeah but I'm okay, gonna turn so it over my to connection you. is absolutely it's better now it's better now uh, I'm gonna turn it over to her to talk about the mission statement um, so go ahead Miss uh, Miss Alicia Smith Freshwater my favorite Smith. Okay, <laughs> I won't tell my twin you said that, but anyhow, so I, I you, you may. Uh, this to everyone and to offer feedback. But when we challenge, we were looking at our current mission statement and our vision statement, and we wanted it to be more reflective of what we do as a citizens advisory, advisory, you know, committee committee. What is it that we do? What do we make sure we ensure? So what I put together is just a definition of a vision statement and a mission statement. But if you could move to the last slide. All right. Yes, and you can see what's in the purple in the far right 
of the screen is our current mission statement. The Citizens Advisory Committee works to facilitate citizen participation in the planning and implementation. I hope everybody can see that. Of uh, the Durham Community Block Grant Program, C, of course, CDBG. The CDBG program works to ensure decent, affordable housing to provide services to the most vulnerable in our communities and to create employment opportunities through the expansion and retention of businesses. So in interviews and in discussions, the question came out to facilitate you know, companies or new businesses, startups here. What is this committee really doing? And so we felt like, okay, well, what we do do, we do know that we recommend allocations to uh, the city uh, council, I guess it's the city council commissioners um, and county commissioners on how to spend the various grants. We give recommendations, but what are we really doing for businesses? So I just kind of threw this out here for feedback, a mission statement that is more reflective of what we do as a committee. So I wanted everybody to look at it and see if it, if it does provide by the extra level of detail that helps us guide our work and, and seeing if this is measurable for us to understand if we are achieving our goals. So does that make sense? Does anybody have any thoughts right now or do you need to really think about this? I'll, I'll make a, a remark, um, and this is kind of just something that I've seen uh, recently, and especially just a nod to what Neighborhood Improvement Services has done with their equity blueprint, but, um, but the use of the word resident versus citizen, and I know we're, we're called the Citizens Advisory Committee, but um, some of these some of these populations that we're serving through these grant programs may not consider themselves citizens right so um in that in that blueprint you won't see the word i think in 12 to 16 pages you won't see the word citizen pop up but the the term resident is used throughout so it's just something that I wanted to throw out there. I'm not sure if anybody else has kind of been thinking about that as well. So that, Rachel, that is a good point. I think that's very, very uh, timely. So what would we say then? We would say the CAC facilitates resident participation or are you saying in, the, in our current mission statement? I think in our current mission statement, yeah, subbing out citizens, taking out citizens, and replacing it with residents. Um, okay. We have it in there at the end of the sentence there, and then that calls that calls into question clearly the the name of our our committee as well. And I don't know, I don't know what sort of process that would be um, to consider renaming that. But um, but I think to start, we can easily do that with the mission statement right now, yeah. I think that, I think that's a, a great point, um, especially during Absolutely. these times. Um, I would like to get some feedback from staff about that, um, on both points actually. I think that raises a great point because the word citizen is, has uh, has been politicized uh, at this point where it's become a negative for those who live and reside in our county that may not be um, documented. Um, you know, so what is the staff's opinion about changing that word and the possibility of some point changing the name of the committee from Citizens Advisory Committee to maybe Residents Advisory Committee? So uh, I would respond, <clears throat> and uh, I would play those on two different tracks. 
One, the uh, changing of the mission statement and going from citizens to residents has been a common practice of the city uh, in terms of everything that uh, is done in terms of publications, uh, in terms of uh, our policies, in terms of how we public affairs and how we represent. Uh, so that that is an excellent idea. I would put the uh, changing of the name on a separate track. We're going to have to do some research uh, on that uh, just to make sure things are in order. So there is a difference between the two. And so I would say for the resident, there's no question about the resident using that in the mission statement. Public Affairs has been using uh, residents for some time and not using citizens. But the uh, name, we're going to have to do some research on. Thank, thank you for thank you for that. Um, I guess that that that'll be something that we can look for uh, as a board going forward. Thank you, Rachel, for those um, for those words. I think those were poignant. Um, anybody else have any uh, questions for Miss Alicia? And um, uh, Chairman Barnes, if I could just add, yes, I. I don't think we should make the decision today if, if everybody could just, if we all could just take this as kind of like a homework, you know, assignment, how can we massage a wordsmith, you know, either statement, okay. our current one versus what's being proposed and see how we can make it sure it's reflective of what we do and the value that okay. we bring. Okay. okay. Um, so if I, I have no problem with that at all, because I think, as an exec committee, we did talk about trying to move on this no later than really next month, um, because this was something that we really wanted to get done before 2020 ended. Um, so if uh, I would definitely like to the body to take a look at um, both the current mission statement and a re the revised updated 2020 mission statement. Um, and if there's anything that you feel like that should be uh, added or or any changes at all, if we can email Miss Smith Freshwater no later than uh, I would say what the week before the meeting, the next month's meeting, is that enough time for you to be able to take all those things in an advisement? Sure, absolutely. Okay. So that would be the the 19th of October. No, that's when our next CAT meeting is. I'm sorry. Am I right? No, our next exec meeting is the 19th of October. I'm sorry. So yeah, the 19th of October, that's a Monday. Um, so then that'll give Miss Smith Freshwater a whole, Alicia, I'm sorry, because you don't want me to uh, a week to be able to, to, to put that together. Um, so we can, I, I don't think we need a motion on that. That is just something that I can just say that that's, you know, I think we can agree as a board to take the, take that recommendation. And then in turn, uh, we will get any, a, any at all edits, uh, corrections that we would like to see uh, to you uh, by the 19th. And on the uh, October meeting, we will make this an agenda item where we can discuss any and all uh, corrections that you ha have made, and then turn make a take a, make a vote uh, vote on the mission statement. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I have a, a question that's in the chat that I'm going to uh, ask to Matt Snores to address. I don't know whether it's possible. I'm not the technology uh, guru but it's asking why don't we set up a Google Doc where we can offer edits and uh, vote on the revised statements next meeting. So the point is about the Google Docs. I don't know whether uh, and how that's possible. Matt, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I, I think that's an excellent idea and I wholeheartedly support that idea. Mr. Johnson, I will say with, with uh, with with what we have available with um, our technology, we, we don't have Google Docs as part of our platform. Everything that the city has is through um, OneDrive and setting something up for uh, for interface the way that I think Google Docs is, is able to do that in a way that we can't do that. Um, so 
I would say we would certainly be able to support that if, if there were members that would be able to set that up uh, externally, but we don't have, as city staff, we don't have the ability to set up anything Google related. Everything we do is through Microsoft and it's through OneDrive. Okay, and this is Alicia. I can set it up. This is Alicia. I can set up a shared document and just share it with everybody via your email for edits. Yeah. I can set that up. Uh, thank you so much. I was going to say I was going to ask whether or not you would be able to do that. Um, and I think that you should have everyone's email addresses based on the directory. Yes. And M Mr. Chair, I'd be glad to help facilitate that. If that was set up okay. by a member, I'd be glad to make sure that, that all, you know, everyone emails and et cetera are shared with uh, Alicia so that she can, you know, make sure that she gives permissions for people to access it. And I'd be glad to help facilitate however I can. We just can't host it or, or sort of directly involve it with uh, Google. Ten for it. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so I have you, you and Alicia can get together on that and then that can be distributed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to the rest of the body for comments by the 19th of October. Um, and then that way we can, it could be organized and then we can make, we can make votes uh, on different yes, revisions and then hopefully vote on the mission statement. Yes, sir. Uh, this, thank you, this, Ms. Yes, ma'am. This is Ms. Conyers and I, I just want to insert that I hope that everyone has provided Ms. Washington with um, their contact information if it needed to be updated or if something was missing from the directory. And then we also want to make sure that we add um, Councilman Freelon to our directory with his appropriate contact information. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Conyers, for that. Um, so, I'm just going to kind of move forward into the last item of, uh, of the agenda, uh, the second to last uh, CSC member discussion. Um, this, is, this is an open discussion about what is it that um, this body wants to get out of being on this board. Uh, the reason why I said that is we've talked about, we talked about it a little bit on the exec committee and uh, Mr. Johnson and Matt talked about, um, you know, as far as hopefully we can get other the organizations and nonprofits that receive funding to come in and talk to us that way we can ask questions about you know where you know what what they're doing with funds and um you know how how are they putting the funds to action right um what i don't want um is for us to meet once a month and there's nothing that we get out of it uh we all all of us are professionals all of us have been in meetings where we meet and we can't get back that time that we just sacrificed. Um, and so this is a member discussion about what are some of the things that you guys would like to see, um, whether it be presenters or whatever, um, to keep it fresh, to keep us um, to motivate it on the task at hand, um, you know, I, I say this is the most important board that we do have because we're the oldest board and we know that directly affects folks who are in the most need. Um, but meetings can be stale. And yes, we're all learning the different grants and we still need to, because I want us to be able to, if a, a citizen comes up to us and says, hey, what does the ESG mean? What does that stand for? How can I, I know with this group that we'd be able to give them the information that they need. Um, but besides Mr. that, Chair, I see a hand raised. Okay, but yeah. So besides that, what There's else? There's a couple. Like there, uh, who, who? I can't even see it. So you go ahead and call them out. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, uh, Miss uh, Ashley Robbins, I believe, has her hand raised. Awesome, Ashley. What's going on? Um, so I guess to answer your question, I had to. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, yes ma'am. Hear you. Okay. Um, so. In response to your question directly related to the conversation that we just had, um, I'm curious how as a body that we can support some of these organizations who aren't able to access some of this money because they don't have people to do the administrative work because that seems like a, um, a, 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 a bad way to not be able to 
I, I can't think of the words uh, I'm trying to say. Anybody but, else? Yeah. Uh, you, you had more than one or you just had that one? I didn't... Yeah, I had one more. And the second thing is um, I'm interested in how as a body, as we're coming up on the year since the McDougal Terror situation with CO2 and a recent um, news story about a family in Liberty Street um, living with a massive roach infestation <clears throat> that prompted ten ten thousand dollars in donations from the story. Um, I'm kind of curious what role, if any, this body can play in ensuring that D DHA is properly addressing these types of things and holding the appropriate people accountable for, for, for failure to provide safe, clean housing for our fellow residents. Thank you for both of those uh, thoughts. Um, definitely been heavy on my mind as well, uh, as far as the, the latter the latter one that just happened with Liberty Street. Um, anybody else uh, have, I mean, this is open for us, so there's no, you know, I, what what do you guys want? I, I mean, that's literally what I'm asking. What do you guys kind of want to, what can, what do you want to get out of this meeting, out of these board meetings? I mean, I know y'all love the fact that we end on, on time a little early. I try to do that part, but, um, you know, if this is this, you know, the only, the, the way this works is, is if everybody feels like they have a shared accountability about it. Um, a lot of times when you, somebody's the chair or something like that, oh, well, chair, nah, I believe in collective. And um, this thing doesn't work without you guys, so. Anybody else have anything? I, I, hey, uh, Mr. Chair, this is Pierce Freelon. Yes, sir. Uh, I just have a, a comment on um, the, what Ashley just said. Um, so the, the Durham Human Relations Commission, which before I was um, appointed to city council, I was the vice chair of that organization. Now I'm also the liaison there as well. Um, has created a uh, a public housing accountability committee subcommittee, and uh, I wonder if it might be who both organizations or both uh, you know committees to collaborate with one another on those efforts instead of working kind of in silos and separate institutions. It was it was formed before the uh, uh, before the carbon monoxide um, situation in McDougal Terrace, actually when they were trying to do evictions last winter, um, we were hearing complaints about living conditions uh, and sewage and all types of other things. And so we formed that committee in the HRC. And if that's something of interest, uh, it might be a, a good idea to, uh, instead of replicating efforts to join the, the work that's already been done on the HRC and to see how these two boards can collaborate. Um, doesn't answer your question, but does speak directly to what some of your members would like to see. So just wanted to put that out there. I, I'll pass that to Mr. Johnson on as far as I know that we do, based on what was just stated that DHA can now be included in funding from the grants that we kind of recommend whether or not that's something that can happen is that collaboration something that this is in our purview that we can do. Well, I was asking you for you. Yeah. yeah, I was asking you, Mr. Johnson, on on, on uh, we'll make some recommendations. We'll make some recommendations on that. I'm not uh, familiar with the uh, uh, human all of the intricacies of the Human Relations Commission, but we'll be glad to look into that and talk with my comp counterparts. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, does anybody else have any comments? I know Brian, I think we kind of answered Brian during the exec meeting, but I didn't know whether or not you wanted to just let the body know what your suggestion was during the time as far as what you wanted to see within the meetings. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, my general thought was was hoping that, you know, we have these grantees that we give a bunch of money to, um, but it would be nice if we could kind of regularly check into them, whether it's give them kind of surveys to just kind of solicit information. Um, you know, someone earlier mentioned, you know, wanting to kind of know what they're up to and how to help them. Um, and, and so it's like surveys about that or um, something I was thinking of was um, 
you know, trying to check in with a lot of our grantees to see like how they've been responding to COVID. Have they provided resources to their residents? Have they, um, how they use funds? Have they been applying for funds? Things like that um, to just kind of get a regular sense of, you know, how, how our grantees are, are dealing with things, how they're handling situations, um, what their needs are and things like that. Um, so that, you know, we have like a regular ability to kind of review their their work. I'll I'll echo that and also um, I agree with Council Member Freelon with kind of focusing on um, triangulating a lot of these efforts right that are already going on whether with city departments or with these other boards and commissions. I think. I think for me too, with, um, with the consolidated plan specifically, there's an engagement component that's required by HUD. And, and I think I would like to see us kind of leverage what the city is trying to do with those community rooted partnerships, because we have a lot of experts, right? Already right. here and making sure that, that they're getting paid to do this work, as opposed to bringing in perhaps an outside consultant. Um, yeah, to help kind of, I think, I think just general awareness too. I think for a lot of this work, residents understand that there needs to be more affordable housing, but to understand kind of what, what, specifically these funds aim to achieve and what purposes they serve. I think there's a role to be played there as well. So. Thank you. Uh, definitely noted. Um, anybody else? Well, we will as an exec team um, in uh, correlation and coordination with the staff um, we will work on these things because I think that's important that we all feel like we're getting something out of the meetings. Um, and that's just critically important to me in my brain as somebody who's tired of Zoom, um, that we, when we leave a meeting, I feel like I learned something more than when I came in. So um, I appreciate everybody's um, response on that. And if you guys have any suggestions that you, didn't think about it at this moment, but come across your mind, please don't hesitate to email me. Um, you know, I respond pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, if you have anything, just email me. If you want something you want to see, email me. Um, and I will do my best to try to make this happen for y'all, for all of us. Um, I, I got one more real quick one for you, uh, yeah. Mr. Chair. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Well, not funny, but so whenever I refer to a group of people as guys, my daughter corrects me and she says, I'm a guy. Yeah, <laughs> you it's better say York folks. Thing. And she's folks. 10 years old. So <laughs> I'm going to speak on her behalf and, and, and say, uh, I appreciate <laughs> you, how you've held down this meeting, but I'm going I'm to call you in on the guys on behalf of my <laughs> daughter, Stella. You're welcome. You. Blame, blame, it, blame it on my culture of New York. And so I apologize. <laughs> All of all of us folk, thank you. Uh, it's just like I had to learn the word season when I first moved back down to North Carolina, what season meant. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate all of you folks. I really do. Um, and you guys make my job a lot easier than what it need, really needs to be. Um, so I, just some quick announcements. I'm moving to the last part. Uh, we did have a resignation that came across my table. Uh, you know, it's and I responded back to Matt Lawing, but Matt Lawing has resigned um, the board. And, and I did thank him on behalf of not just the members of the board, but also staff uh, for his uh, dedication to being a part of his board for the last um, couple, a year and a half at least. Um, and that was that one announcement that I have. Does anybody else have an announcement or anything? Make sure you do your census. Make sure you're registered to vote. Make sure you get your mail in early mail in ballots if you if you're doing it that way. Uh, that's all I got. If nobody else has anything, 
and I'll take a motion to adjourn, and I'll see you in October the 20th. Matt had it up. It was uh, October 26th. 26th. Sorry. October the 26th at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Yeah, sorry. I'm just trying to monitor chat as well. That's all right. Uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. I will see you guys in October. Thank you, guys. Pierce, appreciate you. And all my good folks on this board. Thank you. <laughs>